the event germinated as an idea in the confabulations between Dr. Samir Saran, Professor Harsh V. Pant, and myself when we conceived of something along the lines of Rizina Dialogue, though on a very small scale, to take policy nuances from the higher echelons of diplomacy to the younger generation that continually strives and stretches for newer avenues of learning. The association of two great institutions, Hindu College, currently India's most prestigious college, celebrating its 125th year of eminence, and Observer Research Foundation, which beginning its journey in 1990, in the past 30 years of its existence, has effectively narrated and participated in India's story as the country has acquired an unmistakable global footprint. From primarily looking inward and engaging with domestic reforms to gradually forging global partnership, ORF today plays a seminal role in building political and policy consensus that enables India to interact with the world. As new powers re-emerge onto the global stage, Existing systems face challenges of agreeing on a new set of rules to control and regulate the new frontiers of space, the ocean, the internet, and the human mind. The world continues also to navigate persisting concerns related to security and strategy, economy and development, energy and resources. As India begins to play a larger role in the 21st century, ORF continues to push normative boundaries, bring new ideas into policy discourse, and provide a platform to a new generation of thinkers. It is supported in its mission by leading intellectuals, academicians, policy makers, business leaders, institutions, and civil society actors. The Hindu ORF policy conclave is, a, is in an essence and spirit serves as a mega policy summit which aims to take the pedagogic discourse beyond the confines of classroom and help students grapple with current socio-political affairs of the world. A one of, its own, a one of its own kind program, the Conclave aims to bring celebrated policymakers and scholars on a single stage and provides the students with the opportunity to partake in dialogue and deliberations. I am grateful to ORF for giving us the opportunity to host this prestigious event since 2018. This is the fourth edition of the Conclave and assumes special significance given the fact that it is being conducted after a hiatus of two years due to COVID-19 pandemic. Espousing a multilateral and issue-based orientation, India's presidency at the G20 and leadership of the Voice of the Global South Summit testifies to this manifestation of India's centrality in navigating such times of trial and turbulations. Spearheading a group that represents around 85% of the world's GDP and is responsible for 75% of the global trade, India has a pivotal role in shaping the global trajectories of variety of crucial agendas. This year, we have been supported by the T20 group and the G20 Secretariat in organizing the conclave, which has been aptly based on the theme, Vasudhaev Kutumkam, symphonizing voices across the globe. We have four sessions lined up for the day based on the themes, voices of multilateralism in the 21st century, voices for life and attaining SDGs, voices for bridging digital divides, voices of solidarity in the global south. I welcome you all to this conclave. What distinguishes excellence is the ferment of ideas, the thinking, the uh, innovation. And I've always complimented uh, Samir for taking uh, one part of the G20 process uh, into a particular direction, which is the, you know, world of ideas, the T20, I think that's what you invited me to an event. And he told me that he wanted to discuss the UN and multilateralism with me in general form. So I thought I'd say a few words to uh, set the context and then I'll sub happily subject myself to Samir's grilling. First and foremost, I think we tend to forget, most of us, that the world that we know now and particularly the multilateral system as it exists today is the product of a crisis, is the product of a war which took place and whilst the Second World War was still raging, some uh, representatives of 44 countries gathered in a sleepy village 
in New Hampshire called Bretton Woods and they designed the architecture of a of the new global order and out of that was born the International Monetary Fund out of that was born the World Bank and the United Nations and the multilateral system anchored in the United Nations and when I got this invitation from Samir I looked for a book in my library and I was able to find it late last night the Bretton Woods the Battle of Bretton Woods John Maynard Keynes Henry Dexter White and the making of a new world order I'm just making this submission to you that whilst representative of the 44 countries were at that sleepy New Hampshire village in 1944 whilst the war was still going on the power of ideas on what the new world order and economic order should be came from intellectuals so never ever try to trivialize the power of ideas the value of ideas and the role of people who are capable of doing enlightened thinking for public policy so I want to start with that and I just read out something from the inner cover and this is a book by somebody called Ben Steele that I must have acquired it God knows how many years ago when I was in New York it says when turmoil strikes world monetary and financial markets leaders invariably call for a new Bretton Woods to prevent catastrophic economic disorder and diffuse political conflict uh, I'm just trying to see when this book was published uh, it is entirely possible that it owes the same time when the G20 was born why do I say this because when the economic world economic crisis hit us and I'm talking about the year 2008 or thereabouts it's an economic crisis which arose from the prime lending sector in the real estate world but it uh, slowly because of the levels of integration and globalization it galloped from there and hit world markets because India was not as integrated in the global economy we were able to save it uh, save insulate ourselves up to a point what was the uh, response of the established institutions of that time uh, the United Nations the monetary fund the World Bank many of them frankly speaking and I say this with a degree of responsibility were clueless on how to handle the uh, the scale of the economic crisis so there used to be a group meeting at finance ministers level they upgraded that group into a summit level group of the G20 now the meetings of the G20 which took place London thereafter will always be remembered because they were able to take decisions in the area of economic policy macroeconomic policy which helped soothe the situation and bring about some calm and order today the crisis that the global economy faces and I don't just mention one crisis there are multiple crises and I'll come to that India's G20 presidency is taking place at that time of crisis I don't think between then and now there were some presidencies which had to deal with it but I think the crisis is full born and if I tell you the crisis at least uh, the food fuel and fertilizer crisis these uh, together uh, the SDG report 2022 suggests that these crises could push an additional 75 to 95 million people into extreme poverty and jeopardize the SDG objective these are reports by people who've applied their minds coming to the areas of um, policy which with which I have the privilege of being associated I just want to spend a minute or two on the energy situation no matter whom you speak to there are two issues about the global energy crisis or challenges which stare you in the face is that if the producing cartel those who are in the production business um, if they want to get or rather organize a situation they will if you discuss with them they will tell you we don't deal with the price we only decide how much quantity to release of crude oil 
total global consumption is 100 million uh, tons, 100 million barrels a day. Uh, India's consumption today is about 5 million barrels a day. If you were to reduce the uh, availability by 1 or 2 million barrels a day, the amount of uh, the price would go up from the current 85 or so to 120, 130. But what equally stares you in the face is that thanks to the pandemic and thanks to the fact that a um, lot of countries pumped in stimulus packages, one country put in $20 trillion, produced an inflationary situation. There's a fair amount of money lying around. And now even all the interest rates raising which are taking place all over the world, they are not going to be able to mop up that excess liquidity with any easy. So if you have high energy prices on top of an already existing inflationary situation, you go into what is called the big R or recession. So you've got two challenges. You've got a crisis on food, fertilizer and uh, fuel. But you also have an inflationary situation and you have one group of countries wanting to get a better return. I mean, I don't know. And how is the rest of the world to manage? There's a country around India which uh, has to shut off its electricity at, in the evening because it, it's just not, energy is not available. There's another country uh, in India's vicinity to which we have given, I think, $4 billion, I think, uh, Secretary External Affairs, $4 billion in, I uh, think. And yet, how has India managed this? And there I'm going to conclude with this. I think the Prime Minister was very clear that the so-called Yesterday, I was uh, uh, with the chief economist of the BP, who did release the BP outlook. The trilemma, energy availability, affordability, and sustainability. I think what is remarkable is that within this splintering system, we were able to ensure that there was not a day's energy shortage in any part of the country. Even during the torrential rains in parts of the northeast, our OMCs were able to carry cylinders on their shoulders literally and so there's been nothing. Our prices are amongst the lowest in the world. How did you do it? Prime Minister cut excise on petrol and diesel on two occasions, November 22 and May, uh, November 21 and May 22. Our BJP rule states did the same thing and we are increasing our biofuels uh, mix from 1.4 percent, we've gone to 10 percent. We had a 20 percent target till 2030. We're going to do it by 2025. Host of things. I'm not coming to share with that. Uh, to stake your time on that. But I place before you two propositions, and after that, I'm going to allow uh, Samir to set the tone. One is that the global system, multilateral system that we inherited, which means a system which essentially was born out of the Second World War and the purpose of the UN was clear to prevent another such war taking place. This is the piece of the pillar, if I may loosely call it, and the development uh, pillar. My submission to you is that the founding fathers, no matter howsoever brilliant they were, they were not able to fully comprehend the challenges which the global economy is facing today. Multilateralism, if you define it as one country, one vote, and there are 193 uh, member states of the United Nations, good. Everybody has a feeling of participation. But if you look at the effectiveness quotient, Somewhere in those numbers, etc., you are able to navigate outcomes. You look at smaller bodies, the Security Council has 15, five permanent members with a veto. Uh, all the wars that have broken, broken out, invariably what stands out is that if one of the permanent members of the Security Council is a participant, Security Council is paralyzed. I had the privilege of presiding over the Council when the outbreaks in Libya and Syria took place. I saw it at first hand. In the case of Libya, we had a Security Council authorization, but not of the kind that we thought uh, we were getting. In the case of Syria, Security Council couldn't get a, uh, its act together. 
With whatever has happened in the world in the last 10 years, I don't think the UN and the Security Council were able to make the kind of contribution they needed to. On the development side, all the new developments, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, the other challenges, there has largely been tweaking and action outside. So, clearly one of the first realizations I had is that you have to rethink the system. And by rethinking the system, I don't mean just reform for the sake of reform. You have to ensure that institutions are fit for purpose. And by being fit for purpose, they are able to deal with this situation. In the case of energy, everybody said, no, 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 no more investment into fossil fuels. You know, we are going into new one. You can't go into new areas of green energy unless you are able to develop and ensure that you are even in a position to transition from the present to a new one. In the years to come, I think India has moved from being the ninth largest economy to the fifth largest. If I look at global GDP, if we continue the current rate of growth, it's only a matter of uh, time before we are the third largest economy. But with that economic size also comes responsibility. And I'm sure that is where the MEA, the G20 processes, events like this, especially the interaction with the younger group. My friend whom I didn't quote was Naseem. He said, don't waste your time looking at this. Spend time with younger people. They will give you the ideas on how to take it forward. And therefore, I think uh, we are well positioned. And uh, dialogues like this, all the other dialogues that you assure, get more and more younger people involved because they may be able to show you a, a, a path well, I'm not suggesting that people of... Samir is younger than me, so I hope he doesn't mind being equated. I don't think we are short of ideas. But I think the entrenchment of positions, you know, we, 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 this has been our position. We tend to move out of entrenched positions with a little more uh, difficulty. I think when the younger people confront you with ideas, I hope it's only a nudge. But if we don't move from those positions, it will be a kick. And that is where evolutionary change can become painful. Thank you very much, but let me just put the record straight. The reason why I was absolutely desperate to convince the minister to be with us this morning was because there are, amongst various changes, three big revolutions are defining India of tomorrow. One of them you could loosely term as a human revolution, young people, um, now deciding to take the lead, building new business models, social models going ahead. The human revolution is clearly one of India's strongest transitions that is underway. The second is what I would loosely call the energy revolution, moving uh, from just the question of access and affordability to uh, sustainability and uh, independence and, and energy security in, in new formats, from old energy to new energy, from uh, uh, cities to uh, peri-urban and rural areas. There's a remarkable transformation underway. And the third is what you could loosely define as the technology revolution. Uh, the coming of age of Indian platforms, financial inclusion, business models, women, entrepreneurship, etc. And so as it would happen, all three of them are either centered around urban areas or are directly dealing with your energy ministry. In many ways, whether you like it or not, you are a custodian of these three big revolutions that are defining India of tomorrow. And therefore, you are best placed to engage with this audience that is going to be part of all three of these revolutions as we go ahead, sir. So uh, that is the reason why. And of course, you've also taught in the university across the road, the college across the road. And we thought that it would be good to get you back to the vicinity, uh, not just as an alumni, but also as someone who imparted wisdom to the college. Uh, 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 across the road. So, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. And I think it would be fair to ask you the first question around multilateral Uh One of India's big areas of focus during its G20 presidency is reforms of multilateralism. Uh, if UN is not fit for purpose anymore, is it time to repurpose UN itself? Or are we really thinking of a new architecture 
that will also include other institutions and other groups that may be more uh, competent in today's world. Thank you very much, Sameer. Uh, by the way, for most of you who uh, don't know Sameer as well as I know, he's a, uh, he uses uh, charm, uh, flattery, uh, and uh, he has a way with words. Uh, it goes well with me, but I think you're probably overstating it a little in my case. Yes, I have the privilege of being associated with two ministries where technology and all these things that you mentioned play a role, but I'm only a very small uh, uh, part of a larger system uh, which uh, I think uh, has been devised in its current avatar by the Prime Minister when he assumed responsibility in 2014. But some of these processes were underway. But yes, I absolutely agree with you. Certainly things like uh, uh, the technology aspect of it, the, uh, uh, you know, the inclusiveness. In, in, it comes social inclusion, financial inclusion, technology plays a role. All that uh, is, bears the, uh, you know, imprint of the Prime Minister. And uh, the urban space, if I may use it technically, a term, Urban space is important because in the past the West uh, termed us as uh, reluctant urbanizers. But today everybody is uh, acutely conscious of the fact that today we are building something like 700 to 900 million, uh, is it square feet or square meters of meters of urban space every year, which is the equivalent of a Chicago. And that's a fact. I mean, you know, it's taking place. Uh, how much of the GDP is accounted for by the urban space? I think about it was over 65% already. Um, what it means in reality is that uh, uh, the urban space today is um, witnessing a transformation, uh, both in terms of uh, economic contribution, bettering the lives of people. I mean, I can give you a few examples just by way of, uh, we started the urban transport or metro system something in 2002 when Mr. Vajpayee was the Prime Minister. Today we have 850 kilometers of metro. We are the fifth largest metro system in the world. But we have 1,039 kilometers of metro under construction, which means that in a few months' time, we will have overtaken Japan, Korea, and the United States to become the second largest metro system because uh, the United States have 1,500 kilometers of metro, but they are not building more metros. They have already got a, a fairly developed infrastructure. So from nowhere we have come in 2002 to we are going to be the second largest metro uh, provider in the, in the world. On energy, I think the remarkable thing here is that when you are faced with a crisis, on any front, then the normal temptation is to take a shortcut. And the shortcut would be to hell with the concerns of uh, you know, sustainability and green transition. Let's go back to uh, you know, traditional polluting ways. The why I think the India story stands out for is that India is the only country in the world today which has not allowed its green commitment to be diminished or derailed by this crisis. In fact, our economic entities, if we said net zero by 2017, others have said, no, we'll do it by 2040, 2045, the OMCs, etc. Transition to, and I just conclude on the energy part. I was ambassador to Japan in the year 2006 to 8. 2006 to 9, 8. And, oh, Japan, I'm sorry, Brazil. No, but I'm very happy I was in Brazil. Uh, I'm Japanese speaking, so when I got posted to uh, Brazil, my Portuguese speaking colleague, Hewan Singh, got posted to Japan. So this is a slip. I, in that time, we tried our best to get 5% ethanol blending in our fuel. We were not, not able to. In 2014, we were at 1.14%. We had a target of 10% by 2020. To November, uh, November, we did it five months in advance. We have a target of 2030, 20%, 20 
We've done, we are going to do it five years in run. 2030, we brought it to 2025. But I'm making another point. We are learning as we are going ahead and we are also revising our targets. I'm going to make an admission here that this 20% blending target was because we had been told that the existing engines of automobiles are in a position to take fuel blending only up to 20%. But all the new models which are coming in are E85. So you want to, so that inhibition is gone. So today, I mean, uh, we are sanctioning uh, uh, ethanol and green energy uh, plants. Uh, yesterday in a discussion with the chief economist of BP Outlook, I told him that I've fascinating analysis. I mean, he said India is a real growth story, etc. But as some of the targets, he said, he felt that the 5 million metric tons per annum green hydrogen was over ambitious. I told him that I found it conservative and one of our companies, uh, CMD was there and I told him, Kitna karo he said, 1.8 to mahi karunga. So I think that because what do you need for green hydrogen? You need green energy, I mean we are the only country in the world which has demonstrated that you can uh, reduce the cost per unit of solar from 25 cents to 3 cents. And you need water and you need um, uh, electrolyzers. Now any electrolyzer manufacturer in the world that I know of are all collaborating here. And green ammonia, which our companies are already into uh, contracts to export to Germany. I signed a contract with my counterpart in um, uh, Singapore. The new GE plant that is coming up, green ammonia, will go from one of our companies there. I make the submission to you that India is firing on all six cylinders, both in terms of increasing ENP in uh, uh, traditional, let's say, oil, gas, our gas uh, production goes up by 18% every year. It was 18% previous year, 18% in this now. And you have a background in the energy sector. It is a place our energy demand and consumption is growing at three times the global pace. And I make one concluding comment. Compressed biogas, 5,000 satellite plants, just keep them at the back of your mind. But energy consumption is one thing when your per capita income is 2,000. But if you accept the analysis of Ernest Young, all these people, when your per capita income goes up, five to six times, which it will. Your energy consumption also, it's, 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 it's quantum and it's uh, character changes. You cannot expect more energy consumption in the United States and Europe because they're all at that point, or in Japan. If I may uh, submit also China, because China at the current rate is it's, it's, its peak. But where will it grow? It will grow in India because although we are a large economy now by global standards, our per capita income still need uh, to catch up. So I think this is where the growth story is. And, and uh, Mr. Minister, on the question of the UN, why uh, are we so uh, determined to save the UN, invest in its reforms, or are we equally uh, innovating around new institutions and new solutions? Samir, I am going to be very candid. The pleasure of unilateralism I think belongs to no one. There are instances in history and I've got some very eminent people who studied this sitting here. There are points of time in history where we think that uh, we are strong and God has been kind to us, therefore we can act unilaterally. That is the extreme. And I don't think anybody can get away with that because there are consequences. Then the strong prefer bilaterally. And I've heard Indian diplomacy over the years say, why should we go multilateral? We can solve our problems bilaterally. I think this is delusion. You need the multilateral system and you need multilateral approaches because it is going to be a very long time before you are in a position, uh, even when you are a $26 trillion economy, you still need the system. Now, whether it's a multilateral system as you know it, or it's the anchor in the UN, or it's a new system that will arise, I really don't know. But I would be, with 39 years of the foreign service and still learning, I would say that multilateralism is the preferred, should be the preferred approach. Within multilateralism, you must allow yourself plurilateral approaches where if 193 are not able to do it, 
you form what I, what I call coalitions of the willing, right? Whether it's G4 for reform or it's G20 here. I think that's a part of how you evolve. When you were not so economically strong, you wanted to, uh, you try to set up something on the G15 where you had leadership of uh, the developing countries. But today, I mean, don't misunderstand what I'm saying is, we look forward. I mean, you have a prime minister is talking about India at 100, 2047. You become a developed nation by that. Shed your colonial mindset. And frankly, when that idea came, it's caught on now. Now everyone is thinking of India forward looking. That is when you become in 2047, I mean, it's a matter of conjecture whether you are a 30 trillion dollar economy or whatever. You're not just going to be a developed country. My understanding is that you will be a developed country much before 2047 if you go by the current indices. But you need the multilateral system. I would be one, you have a UN there. Aren't you much better off strengthening that? Then, but well, there's another approach. I mean, I forget the. Uh, article in the uh, charter which says you should have a conference of parties and redraw the whole thing. But all reform as I know it, I mean, I don't, uh, I mean, ever since I have begun to understand it, it only takes place when there's a crisis. Now, there is a crisis today, but will reform come out of this crisis or will we global economies? But I can tell you the contours of interstate relationships. The rise of China, the coming of age of certain other parts of the world, these are challenges which are being factored into now. Whether they will find expression in a blueprint for a new order, I don't know. But I still think you need a multilateral system and you need, if you, you have the current one, if it doesn't uh, reform, the people will reorganize themselves in it. Mr. Puri, there is also now a renewed focus on the global south. Now, of course, as a, a post-colonial nation, we had solidarity, we had common aspirations, we had a journey that we could relate to uh, in terms of our uh, nationhood uh, or the modern avatar of those nationhood. Uh, how is it different this time that we refocus on the global south today? What is the difference in your assessment as someone who has served in the 20th century diplomatic architecture of India and now in its 21st century of Kali, you are part of the political leadership. How different is the engagement with the Global South going to be? So when you have your uh, session with Secretary of External Affairs, uh, that's a question you should put to him. Because he speaks uh, on behalf of the MEA. I have a personal take on it. I think the focus on uh, non-alignment, the Global South, had a context. It had a context. And naturally, for a country which uh, came out of the uh, you know, colonial uh, ecosystem, I mean, uh, we had 190 years of privileged association with one country. Uh, a Cambridge economist, uh, Angus Madison, whom I'm very fond of quoting, said that uh, in the year 1700, our uh, uh, contribution to the global GDP was 25% uh, or so. Today, you know, in, in 1950, it came down to 3%. And today, you're again rising there. So it's, talk, it's one thing to talk of the global south when you're in that situation. And it's another thing for you to want to co-opt the global south when you are in the current position. So I think there is a very crucial difference of nuance. I'm not in any way trying to uh, undermine or minimize the Global South, uh, uh, this thing. I think MEA is doing very well by, I think, our tries with Africa, our non alignment, all, all those are very good. But, you know, you are today, uh, your Prime Minister interacts at a summit level with the uh, President of the United States, with uh, the other heads of state and government, from a point where India is making the contribution. You're not going into a collective Global South, this thing, and bargaining on behalf of the Global South. Today, you are able to do the heavy lifting, whether it's disaster relief or the other areas. But that is what India's uh, uh, contribution is. So, you know, uh, Minister, before I uh, turn to uh, some of the young folks to pose a couple of questions, just two questions. So please decide and, and amongst yourselves and please come to the uh, aisle if you have to pose a question to the Minister. I'm going to ask him one more. Minister, I was quite uh, actually informed today of one new facet of your life. 
I always knew you were politically savvy, great debater, a force of nature. Uh, you know, you had a, a certain way of uh, dealing with people and, and countries through your career. I learned today that not only were you a very strong, um, you know, political stu student voice, but you were also a topper in this college. Uh, and, and I have a question for you. Uh, I sometimes feel that some of those who are the brightest minds today in our university system don't embrace the politics of the, uh, the student politics. How do you have a, set an example of being someone who excelled in studies and now is excelling in politics uh, as well? So how do you encourage them to take part in these political processes, have a voice, contribute to shaping the future? Give them a tip. How did you study and also lead a ruckus in the campus? I, I, as I said, uh, I have to be careful with you because, uh, as I said, flattery gets very far, does well with me. But I'm saying something else that uh, I have never understood uh, why anybody thinks that doing well academically means it's, it was a. It, let me be very honest and admit up front. I may have wanted to become a lawyer, but you know the time when or go into law as a profession. But you know, I passed out from the university, 71, BA, I could have gone to law college, I stood first in the university, got a first in MA, I could have done that. But lower, this is what I call the lower middle class imperative. At that point of time, the number of jobs were very limited. If you did well in the university, you could get a teaching job, you, there were one or two banks, there were one or two uh, private sector companies. Uh, Tata's Hindustan Lever. I started with Hindustan Lever. When I saw Hindustan Lever left, came and joined at St. Stephen's College, the choices were very few. And I, last time I had Ryan sitting next to me, so I was very careful with my words. The guys who really did very well, it, that, they, that link with academic achievement wasn't there. Some of our most successful people in our society, and I would recommend this book, uh, Delhi University at 100, which I have edited. It has uh, just about contributions from the Vice Chancellor, from the Chief Justice, etc. It's a different uh, university provides a setting. I was very fortunate, very, very fortunate that I got admission in this college, had excellent teachers, and that I was able to, as a result of that, develop interest. My own view, and this is what I tell people, Academics is the core, it is an essential part because you have a career after that. <laughs> but today the kind of opportunities, the kind of entrepreneurial talent, if you look at the number of unicorns in India, this is what I say, the power of ideas is what will develop. And secondly, I mean, look, I think we, it's a, it's a bad characterization of politics if we turn around and say, we, you know, uh, the guys who are in the political system, no, there's some brilliant people in the political system. I don't want to start naming because I get it. Now, brilliant chartered accountants, some brilliant uh, innovators, uh, engineers, etc. The political system is also changing. The political system today, because of technology, you are able to, uh, you know, cross uh, fertilize in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the kind of talent you can draw, and then you don't need to have all of it yourself. I mean, you can uh, have uh, knowledge access from. The specialized areas also. Uh, first of all, thank you, Samit sir, and Minister sir, for recognizing me and giving me the opportunity to ask the question. My name is Arnavanand Gupta. I am a third year student of political science honors, and my question is related to multilateralism. I heard uh, Minister sir talking about the multilateralism. He started with the uh, Bretton Woods summit and how the multilateralism was conceived. But today we see that the same multilateralism is being raked by the countries who created it. For instance, in case of dispute settlement body of WTO, we see the USA is not appointing uh, the members there. So my question is, whose multilateralism it is? It is a multilateralism of entire world, or it is a multilateralism that is Eurocentric in nature? So whose multilateralism are we talking about? So Thank you. Very good question. So, no, no, I must compliment you. Uh, for asking a very, uh, uh, very, very relevant question. I just want to give you a little history, if you don't mind. When the uh, Havana conference took place, 
It was supposed to be the International Conference on Trade and Employment. And uh, the uh, inter attempt was to set up an international trade organization. Uh, the United States legislature, and I'm only giving you facts, I'm not giving you any comment on that. The United States legislature decided that it did not want to have sovereign decision-making transferred to some outside body and that they wanted to retain that power. So the Havana Charter could not be approved in its entirety and only Chapter 4 of the Havana Charter, uh, which deals with tariffs, uh, was established and you and the organization which came into being what's called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade or GATT. That GATT was the precursor to what is the WTO now. But I think your question is extremely relevant that the doubts which were there in the US mind at the time of the uh, Havana Charter have not changed. But that is something which is understandable. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's understandable, but they say we're the world's largest economy. We are the, why should we allow a dispute settlement machinery res resident in the uh, uh, in the GATT or the WTO to do it. By the way, I also have the distinction for being the, uh, I, I have participated or chaired in the largest number of dispute cases uh, for any Indian. So, I going back to 1982 PASTA, EU versus uh, uh, US on the PASTA case, where we're dealing with agricultural subsidies on primary agricultural products, and to, you know, steel, alcohol, all those uh, U, U.S., Canada, so on. But that tendency has remained. So if you talk about tweaking, if you talk about reforming the system, you're absolutely right. This is one of the things you'll have to deal with. Because you cannot have a multilateral system where it says Samir is willing to accept this as long as Samir uh, has his way. Yeah. Or that, uh, you know, Mr. Professor Pant is willing to accept this provided he has his way. I mean, it's got to be, there's got to be an acceptance of the fact that, but you know, I think the world is becoming more uh, competitive and it's becoming also in some ways, uh, you know, more uh, confrontational. So you have to be able to reconcile that. I still think a multilateral system and a dispute settlement mechanism within the multilateral system is a better response than saying I'm King Kong and I will settle it on my terms. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Can I request? Thank you very much, sir, for answering the question. Can I request a uh, young lady? Sir, my name is Anjil, and uh, right now I'm pursuing masters in political science from JNU. And sir, uh, the question that I want to ask is about the position of India in United Nations per se, sir, because uh, as you told that um, in future we really are going to be uh, the trillion economy, sir. But that bring uh, that bring me to the question that uh, so even if we land to such a position but if we don't have a strong uh, uh, say in the platforms like UN and that too I am uh, specifically focusing on UNSC because uh, uh, those five countries are always have the say in more or less to the major foreign policies whatever uh, is happening in the world um, and India is always um, uh, <laughs> appear to take the neutral stance uh, sir, I am not condemning its position, but uh, sir, how do you think that India is going to move forward with this neutral stance always? Because there need to be sometimes a strong position that India should hold. And uh, since we are the, uh, you know, sir, in Asia Pacific, we are considered to be the, to be, India is considered to hold a, such a strong position, sir. So even I, if you get a security council vote, Will you take a stand? I think that's what she is. I think, I think, I, think that's uh, I can see where she's coming from. The only uh, difference of nuance I have is that I don't think anyone will say that India does not have a strong voice. People who like us, people who don't like us, they all say that India has a strong voice. On that, there's no doubt. I mean, anyone who's familiar with the UN system, I mean, at least till I was there, or, you know, my younger colleagues are here. India speaks up. India takes position. No issue on that. When you come to Security Council, I wish you were right. I mean, your thesis is that if five permanent members of the Security Council uh, have their say, 
I think the situation is a little worse than that. Even they don't have their say because it's a paralyzed security council. I mean, after the conflicts that I referred to, and I have a book on that, uh, Libya and Syria. I mean, my book, Perils and Women. After that, security council just collapsed, and it has collapsed for a good reason. The security council. What is the significance of the council? Give me a minute, and I'll explain to you. It is the one designated agency in the multilateral system which has the authority to make a determination on whether there is a threat to peace and security. Why is that designation important? Because otherwise, you know, Professor Chandrachut sitting, sitting here will make a determination that there is a threat to peace. Uh, Samir will every morning get up and say, I fear a threat to peace. Security Council having made the determination and that is provided for in the law, then it is the only agency empowered to use such means as are necessary or whatever means necessary, what I'm, the exact language is escaping me now, which means they can authorize countermeasures. So in other words, if there is to be a threat to peace and security and there's going to be a war, security council has to do it. But if you look at the history of all the wars that have taken place, how many went there with security council authorization? I mean, if I didn't like my neighbor and I had the ability to punish my neighbor, I'd go and clobber him. And what you're saying is correct. So there could be a very unfortunate characterization of the Security Council that the Security Council today is also becoming a talk show. So I think the correct answer to that is, A, we need to preserve the multilateral system. We need to ameliorate and correct and strengthen the multilateral system and in that security council reform has to be a central component because if the peace and security one collapses then, then that you know you can have your development pillar you can have your other thing but if the state of you know nrt is to prison look i don't want to say this but the security council the un its greatest success lay in the fact that after 1945, it was able to prevent wars of a global nature, world wars for a long period of time. There are critics of that who will tell you, no, it's not because of the Security Council. It is because of nuclear deterrence. Because there was a deterrent, people were, you know, hesitant, scared to enter into that. But whatever be the truth, I mean, I can't think of anyone being able to Make out a case that you're better off without a, 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 a UN system, without multilateralism, or without a security council. No, we need it. Now, I'm going to take half a minute more. It is very, very easy to criticize the UN. Very easy to criticize the Security Council. But I draw you, and since I'm in a setting where people like to read, please read some volumes called the Intellectual History of the United Nations. And one conclusion which I came to straight away, there is not one UN there. There are several UNs there. One is the body of civil servants, the Secretary General whom you elect, that's one. There is a more important UN there, which is the Member States. UN Charter is something very good. It's we the Member States and we the people. Member States are the second one. The, the most powerful one, because why do you blame the UN Secretariat if, if 193 representatives of countries come and uh, produce gibberish in a uh, deliberation room? And the third one is we the people, civil society. I think of late, I don't know what the situation is, I was PR in New York till 2013, I lived on there. They ended up becoming a more powerful voice. Now, I just want to final concluding. People said, how do you make the UN fit for purpose? The UN decided many years ago to set up, not directly because it couldn't, it would get caught in the wrangles of the uh, multilateral system. They set up an independent commission on multilateralism. With the blessings of the Secretary General, it was anchored in the International Peace Institute. And Kevin Rudd was the chair of that in the independent commission. I was the Secretary General. And we produced about 16, 17 reports. Each one of them, I can tell you, is a standalone document which is as relevant today as ever. But we can produce a report. Who is going to implement it? The implementation must come from we, the member states, those 193. So we can sit here in Hindu college, bright mind, and say UN is no good. If the UN is no good, we are partly responsible. I'm not saying India is responsible. 
other member states are responsible for making it what it is today, which is what? Ineffectual, not fit for purpose, or whatever. Great. I think that's a wonderful uh, discussion with the Minister. Sir, I would just take a platform to put an idea forward, just a minute. Sir, uh, what I think is United Nations was uh, built on a context, right, sir, after the World War II, and that UNSC also, today the membership belonged to all those five parts which were there uh, after the World War II and they hold that position. So what I found uh, in India today, since India is holding such a strong position in uh, Indian Ocean region and it is acting like a big brother to all the neighboring nations, what I, sir, uh, see is that either the structure of UNSC should change or the members should should be uh, extended to include yeah. India as yeah. well. Yeah, I, I, I read what you are. I, as I said, I disagree with one part that India is acting as big brother to all the other countries in the, uh, the state. I must lament, I must tell you, I spent 39 years in the foreign service, five years later, there's 45, another six years as a minister. Sometimes I do worry about the fact that we don't act like big brother because then you're taken for a ride by others. But no, the issue is that even if you want, and I want, you're speaking my language, I want reform of the Security Council. I fought personally for that. But it's not going to come because I want it. It's going to come either there's another crisis or there's a redrawing of the thing. Now, if you're looking for a maximalist uh, uh, goal, that tomorrow morning it will change the composition, which no, you have to negotiate it. So there is an intergovernmental group there, working group. There are other processes you have to participate on those, and you have to, you know, use all the margin of persuasion. But again, I'm going to conclude with one: India is better equipped today, after these nine years of the Modi government, to be able to achieve those objectives. I'm not saying we can succeed. I think we are better equipped today to. Uh, achieve those objectives and to go down that road than at any previous time in history. That's a limited point, I think. I, I think that's a great note to end this conversation with the Honorable Minister. Uh, I must thank him for taking so much time sharing his morning with us. Uh, he has clearly given us and given all of us three uh, very instructive points to consider as we go ahead this day and in our lives. One, uh, this college setting is exactly the place where you should explore ideas in yourself and of course academics are at the core but the future course of your life would also be shaped in the relationships and in the discussions and debates that you take participate in number two read there is lots of literature out there uh, and and there are lots of ideas that have already been placed out there uh, innovation and innovating on those ideas and taking the debate forward must be our duty uh, not necessarily uh, uh, moving in circles. And three, uh, keep inviting him back to these sessions uh, because he is truly someone who has a wide landscape of, of information and, and, and experience to share. Uh, a topper from your university, a political leader from your university, I wish he was from my university.